Good morning. I'm Dr. Brickner, the instructor for Astronomy 2002 in Summer A 2019. We're just going to go through a few key concepts here for uh, our semester and uh, you know, hopefully give you a little head start for the first week of classes. First of all, you may be wondering why you're here. And of course, the answer to that is you're here because of the GEP program. Astronomy 2002 fulfills Science Foundation E1. And so, as you know, you've got to get your GEPs all squared away before you graduate or on the way to graduation. So here we go. Now I'm going to give you a couple, uh, three ideas here to keep in mind through this semester. They're things that we're going to be talking about a lot. Not every day, but most days. First thing, we'll be talking about the diffraction of light. When you expose hydrogen gas to a high voltage, you know, if it's inside of a glass tube and then you zap it up from above and below with a high voltage, it'll emit light. But it's not a rainbow of light. It'll emit a very specific mix of colors. You can see it in this diagram or this screenshot from uh, YouTube and you'll be able to see that uh, very YouTube uh, in our web in in, uh, in our YouTube area uh, so you you can check the link for that in, inside web courses so for hydrogen it's um, called the Balmer series a series of specific colors here's what it looks like this is a nice photograph uh, from a lab um, and you can see there's a, a brilliant red line, kind of an aqua uh, line, and then a couple purpley lines, you know, deep down in the blues and purples and violets. And that's the Balmer series in the visible band. Now we have other series in infrared and ultraviolet, and they're important too. So, uh, but invisible band, uh, that's that's what hydrogen's got. And the important thing is that it's not a continuous spectrum. Now, here's a picture from another YouTube in our YouTube area, uh, which shows the spectrum uh, of an incandescent thermal source. Okay. In other words, the light is producing, it's producing light because it's hot at a certain temperature. And it produces all the colors of the rainbow, which you can see, you know, it's kind of like split apart like a, a spec, what a uh, prism does. You can see that off to the left in this image. All right, so so hydrogen does not do that. And in fact, the elements, uh, all of them, don't do that. They have very specific colors, what we call a discrete spectrum. And this diagram shows hydrogen, helium, oxygen, neon, and iron. And they're all different. And so these spectra, uh, are like quantum fingerprints. We call them spectral lines. And, uh, you know, astronomers, they're constantly looking at spectra. They're on them like a bear on honey. And, uh, and then we're going to be talking about them all the time. Matter of fact, these two up here on top, hydrogen and helium, yeah, that's 99% uh, of the visible universe is hydrogen and helium, you know. But the other uh, elements are important, too. Oxygen, neon, iron. Iron is important for studying supernovas, for instance. So, uh, you know, so astronomers are always looking at all the spectra, trying to figure out, you know, how much hydrogen have I got, how much helium, how much oxygen, how much neon. You know, all the elements. Another important concept is Kepler's third law. Okay, the third law of planetary motion, and it's actually related to black holes. Now, back in the olden days, uh, about 400 years ago, 400 and change years ago, um, the last naked eye astronomer, Johannes Kepler, uh, discovered that uh, planets travel on elliptical paths with the sun at one focus. All right? In other words, they weren't on perfect circles. Mars is especially elliptical. Earth's pretty close to a perfect circle, but... Technically, it's not. Now, here's a picture of an ellipse. This is more of an ellipse of a, a comet. Planets don't have this much ellipticity, but 
Um, so the sun is down here at this focus. Okay, so it's not at the center of the ellipse. Um, he also found in his second law that the area of the ellipse has a very, you know, well-ordered sequence in time. And that's encoded in these little uh, blue and white wedges, you know, like uh, pieces of pie. Except it's kind of a little bit slanty because it's an ellipse. And all the tip of each uh, slice of pie is right at the sun. So uh, those follow a very uh, well-ordered sequence in time. Okay, and we'll be talking more about that in, a, in the semester in some of the other lectures. And the third law is that the square of the orbital period equals the third power of the average orbital distance. Okay, so in the solar system, we measure the period in years, and that's what Kepler did. He didn't know the exact distance. Um, in kilometers or miles that like we do today because we have you know radar ranging and you know all different methods of figuring out distances but he didn't have that so he worked in proportions and so the the distance unit that they used in those days and which we still use is called the astronomical unit so, and, and that's basically the distance of earth to the sun now nowadays we know that's 93,000 or 93 million miles uh, 150 million kilometers but in those days they didn't really know that but they said okay we can work everything out we just keep we know the proportions you know earth is one you know mars is i don't know 1.5 something like that astronomical units out jupiter's a little bit further out and so on and they worked out all those proportions so this law says that okay measure the orbital period uh, how long does it take to make one full orbit in years? Measure the distance in astronomical units. The Earth is equal to one. And square the time. Take the average distance a to the third power. And those will equal. That's what Kepler found. right? And that's the third law. And it's really important. And the reason it's important is, is not specifically for the solar system. I mean, it's, it's good you know, that it works in the solar system. And we use it all the time. But what's really interesting is that Sir Isaac Newton found, just a little bit later than Kepler, that the third law works for any two orbiting objects, like binary stars orbiting each other. And if you know the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper is loaded with binary star systems. They look like one star to the naked eye, but there's actually two stars orbiting there. Anyways, binary stars... Even, a, even a, a one star orbiting a black hole. Yeah, we can figure out the mass of those babies uh, with Newton's version. So Newton's version is over here to the right. And it's got a factor of 4 pi squared and a factor of g in the denominator. And then the sum of the masses of the two stars or to two objects in the denominator, m1 and m2. Right, and that's what we use. And that's how we figured out that there's certain things that we... We can't see them, but we can figure out from the orbits of what we can see, you know, it's partner star uh, orbiting something that we can't see. We can figure out it's a black hole. That's how we first figured out black where black holes are. And so it's uh, really important. And we're going to be talking about Kepler's third law uh, all through the semester because mass of a star is important. Third idea rocks, space rocks, uh, in other words, asteroids, and meteorites if they f fall to Earth. And this NWA 2975, that's actually a piece of Mars. We get those things, they fall to Earth. We can analyze them like any other rock. NWA means Northwest Africa. It's out in the desert. They're easy to spot. Uh, you know, somewhere in, in, here in North America, you know, you know, an, a, a meteorite is hard to find if you don't see it fall. Uh, but out there in the desert, down in Antarctica, that's another place where they're easy to find. Yeah, we pick them up and then we analyze them. And after we analyze them, we figure, oh, yeah, that's actually a piece of Mars. Or it's a piece of the moon. And the reason we know that is we've, we've had spacecraft on Mars that have analyzed the soil and the atmosphere of Mars. And... You know, that allows us to analyze the 
chunks of Mars that fall to Earth that we think are just some rock from space, hey, that's actually a piece of Mars because it has the same um, atmospheric, um, you know, little bubbles of atmosphere trapped in the rock uh, and so forth. And the same for the moon. You know, we've even brought moon rocks back from the Apollo mission. Uh, so we know what moon rocks are like, too. And so we see, um, you know, fragments like that uh, all over the place. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is Alan Hill's, this is L-A-L-H 84001. Uh, this one's from Antarctica. Alan Hill's ice field. And this one's important because inside this one, they've, they've sawed it apart and analyze it and they what they found they think some people think they found uh, fossils of uh, ancient life on mars now that's a controversial claim and not everybody agrees with it but it is something that people are trying to study here's another one you know forget about mars and the moon we've even got a uh, very small fragments from distant red giant stars you know like uh, betelgeuse in the constellation orion if you know that one and uh, and the way that we've done that is we, we sent a spacecraft out to the tail of a comet and we used a device like this on the left. Uh, you, it's about the size of a tennis racket, well, kind of a big tennis racket, I guess. You can see somebody's hand over there to the left. Um, and, you know, we just, you know, that's the Stardust mission. And we've had other uh, missions going out to retrieve asteroids and, and, and comet uh, fragments and bring them home and you know we've analyzed them and you know we see a lot of stuff that is interesting and even stuff that can only be manufactured inside of a red giant star so we know it's you know a red giant star that went into supernova now, supernova is a topic that we're going to talk this semester and believe it or not it connects to asteroids and meteorites that we can see here in the solar system so uh, we're going to be talking about that a lot. So in other words, we have a lot of stuff to learn uh, this semester, so let's get going.